What's going on everyone? Welcome to another strategy session. This is the eighth mission in our nine mission series. Second to last, almost the finale. Everyone's favorite, sweep and clear. In this video, I'm gonna break down exactly how to think about sweep and clear the mission, how to be, play it. If you're an army that likes to take the center, that's gonna be really impactful versus if you're an army that wants to spread out and play all over the place, that's gonna have a different play style. So keep pay attention to that, how going first and going second impacts your two armies and how the relationship between them. And also, of course, what secondary should you be looking at for this mission? If you're checking this out on YouTube, be sure to check out this video along with the rest of our series in the War Room. And of course, we're, that's where we offer tons of other awesome content from you from all the best players in the world. We have a great community where we have a Discord server, tons of people, great ideas, all like-minded individuals just trying to get better at 40K. Super positive, but for now, let's get right into it. We got Sweep and Clear. Sweep and Clear is a mission um, that's it's very interesting. It is a quarter style deployment. So if you were you and your opponent were to start as closely as possible to each other on the quarter style deployment, you would be able to do a very easy turn one charge. I'll line that out for you. Actually, that's been one of our requests. I'll do that right now. Look at that that live content coming in. So in this quarter style deployment, um, you can start really close to each other, but also you could start really far from each other because you are playing diagonally across the entire table. So if both you and your opponent will decide to start behind, say, a ruin wall for a cover that's back in your deployment zone, you could be putting 60 plus inches between you and your opponent, in which case, you know, maybe it's good for you, maybe it's bad for you. But something that's unique to this mission, certainly worth mentioning, is that it's one of the rare missions where you can both stay far from your opponent or play close to your opponent. And in a lot of cases, what happens here is that one person wants to go into their opponent's army, want, they want to charge or do something aggressive, while the other wants to stay far away. So you'll typically see one person um, really push himself up on the line and is ready to charge and expand outward while the other is all the way back real defensive in the corner as I like to play. So um, I've just lined out the deployment zone so everyone can see them nicely on the overhead. But let's go into that overhead so we can start going through deployments. I've set out a Grey Knight army and two Admech units. Very minimalist board here. This isn't even an army. This is three Dread Knights and three squads. Also four servitors, but there's a lot of concepts I want to teach with these models and units as the talking points. So first, let's take a look at the mission itself and where the objectives are placed. We have the deployment zones lined out, and it is five objectives, one in the center of each quarter and one in the center of the table. This is a hold one mission, so if you hold one objective, you get five for primary. If you hold two, you get ten, and more for fifteen. So it's not challenging to score primary per se, because you know you only have to hold two objectives to get ten points, and there's one that's already in your deployment zone. And very, very often, you can hold these objectives, if not completely behind line of sight terrain, at least you, you might see them like this. This is a common thing I found at events where. Half of it's in the open, half of it's not in the open. So generally speaking, you can hide um, from out of line of sight from a lot of these, um, or so I found. So it's not hard to do a push turn one and establish yourself like that to get a two for 10 going. Because this is a well-defended thing, it's very easy to turn it into hammer and anvil. Especially if you don't mind deploying in the open, you put like something tough like a Dread Knight right over here. Really easy to just walk, turn one, get onto that objective, and all of a sudden you're looking at a hammer and anvil game. So the person with first turn has a lot of uh, agency in the style of game that they're playing. Because if you make that push, it's almost it's almost a foregone conclusion that your opponent is forced to either try to fight you, which if you make the push strong enough, they're not able to just come fight you. So they'll naturally react into the free territory that is right here. So if you, on the flip side, if you go very hard and make it a dawn of war by just getting really aggressive, maybe deploying on the line here, because if you deploy on the line here, actually, and you go first, 
You might be in the open, so that's terrifying if you're going second. But this is, I've made this charge turn one before. This is not an untenable charge. Um, especially if you have a line of sight blocker, say here. So imagine, oh, this is actually common on the GW boards. If you had a line of sight blocker here, where your opponent's army is deployed is actually very hard to get an angle on a unit that's like right around here. He himself would have to come out to get an angle like that, which maybe they do, maybe they don't, but that's in the open, creates a whole cascading effect. So keep an eye out for that is all I'm saying. It is definitely possible to do turn one charges in this mission. But yeah, if you want to turn it into Dawn of War as the first player turn, you have a lot of agency to do that instead, which is just taking all of your tools and pushing them this way. Your opponent, this is a very well, easy to fortify spot for your opponent because they can just take a lot of stuff that's hiding behind this wall, which is very common, and just bring it down. You're probably getting in the open here unless you have some good line of sight blockers. So I wouldn't recommend this um, early unless you have some very good speed and line of sight blocking terrain to facilitate that. Um, but keep in mind doing so, your opponent can always just react, you know, abandon ship on this flank, let's, let's head over that way because your flank over here is very weak. So it's very easy to start creating uh, Dawn of War or Hammer and Anvil from this quarter's deployment. And typically, you, you never see this game played in just the fashion of quarter, I'm in my quarter, you're in your quarter, because there are these two objectives hanging out right here, and this middle one we haven't even talked about yet. Um, that's huge. Um, so there, there are three objectives. You draw it like diagonally through the table. There's three objectives in the center, and it's a hold one mission. It's kind of like a very easy vital intelligence if you want to think of it like that. So you're just going to see a lot of movement in this one. So there's another some interesting facts about this mission. What an interesting mission. Um, the objectives are sticky, meaning you, if you control it at the beginning of your command phase, it's yours until your opponent comes and takes it. So infiltrators, infiltrators, um, infiltrators, they do so much for you. They can, one, start in this spot. So they can start all the way over here, start all the way over here. Because it's very hard to actually get from this location to that location um, for normal speed units. If a fast unit can do it, especially if they can advance, same capability to teleport or move twice, fire and fade, anything like that, you'll get it done. But on a normal, like I'm an intercessor and I rolled an advance roll, you're probably not making it. So having, especially for space marine players, but really for anybody, because it's also sticky objectives over here, you, it's really, really good to put something infiltrating here. Um, and what commonly happens, I have found, is if your opponent is trying to sneak up on the side flank here, or maybe this isn't such a well-fortified position and it's like a diagonal ruin like this, Maybe you can just get out over on this angle, find an angle, shoot the infiltrators off, but this will still be your objective because they can't charge. So there's a lot of tactics to be done in this mission where you're very much fighting over primary objectives and they are uh, yours even if you leave. There was actually a fun moment in our game, one of the games from Crucible this past weekend. John was playing Knights and he, was, he had three Majeras and four Armagers. And one of the big problems for that army is actually holding objectives throughout the course of the game because you, at some point you're going to get to spend a 500 point model to hold an objective instead of doing stuff. But in this mission he was able to just hold them at one point and then leave them and then that's, that's amazing for Knight. So especially for elite armies, that's a really good rule. Um, you will typically want to see infiltrators doing something like that um, so that they can get up on this flank and just start getting start getting your board pressure board presence going like you're already established there that's a move you want to do naturally a lot of times just get it going alternatively you could see them over here this i have seen done i have done it it's a very much less common move so imagine the avid player is bulking out this side you could start putting infiltrators there again this would be a push to turn into dawn of war now you don't know if you're going first so the risk here, as opposed to here, is generally speaking on this side, like I said, this is a very easy to fortify defense position, even if you're going second. So scenario one, the rust stalkers or infiltrators infiltrate over here. Granites go first, and they could start turning into Dawn of War. The Admech is quick to react because this is not much difference to a traverse. Flip side, infiltrators go over here, 
interceptors go over here, and then they charge, and then they just die. And then nothing was accomplished. This objective still belongs to the Grey Knights, not the Admech. You just lost five infiltrators. So here is almost like an invitation, and it's a well-fortified spot. Here is a 50-50 chance, because if you hold this at the beginning, that's actually really annoying for someone like the Grey Knights or just any army that has to actually now go over there, otherwise the Admech player gets a free 15. Because a lot of times what happens is, if you're going first with the Grey Knights or some other army, you might not actually make it to this objective unless you've been able to infiltrate onto it. So you might only get a 5 on turn 1, but at least it's not giving your opponent a 15. Um, that's definitely a thing that happens in turn 1. Other things to keep note of. Scout moves. Scout moves are super awesome because, again, let's say the admin player takes his rangers and scouts up on this objective. Boop, 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 boop. And... Not as Rangers. Well, Ranger Scout too, but the, the Cerberus Raiders. And he gets on the objective. And then the game starts. And the Admech player happens to be going first here. Well, start of the command phase. This is the Admech's objective, because their Admech are holding it. All these Raiders can move out back and get back to safety. And this will still belong to the Admech for potentially a stranglehold on turn one without actually giving up any units. Alternatively, you could get real crazy, like Mr. Sieg's, and try to maybe move block an entire army so it can't really get out of its own deployment zone turn one, you'll still hold this objective because even though there's nothing on it, it belongs to you and your opponent couldn't get on it. There is, that's more for like a nine man unit, but there's definitely plays to be done with pre-game moves. Other armies have pre-game moves too. Sisters of Battle, they got their dominions. Uh, dominions, not only are they good for packing the storm bolters, but they give you the pre-game move and this is a mission that's awesome. Nerglings infiltrate. Uh, Space Marines have a variety of stuff. Grey Knights have a Warlord trait that allows pre-game moves. This is one of those missions, same with Vital Intelligence, that those moves matter a lot more. So just keep that in mind, especially because Vital and Sweep and Clear are two missions that are very commonly um, seen in tournaments. So, that was a mouthful. Let's talk about this middle objective. Alright, let's also talk about how primaries go. The person who's going first, generally speaking, can pull an established front off over here and create, turn it into him or an anvil. And this is a common ebb and flow for the game, so I'm just going to talk about it. And that means the person who's going second responds, generally speaking, by turning it into him or an anvil. Now, this is what happens when you have two armies that want that neither one of them want to take the center. None of them really want to fight each other. Um, Admech, a lot of times, don't really feel comfortable with taking the center quickly. They want to sit at a very far away range until you're dead, until there's no more models. Then we'll walk up with our toughness three infantry rangers. So they'll stay far away. Grey Knights, they can be very flexible, and that's why I put them on as the example here, because with enough Dread Knights, you could just take the center, and they're always, their natural play style is actually to stay far away. So. Uh, their natural inclination is to, is to be, do this kind of yin-yang around the table. Um, but of course, they can be pressured into playing the center if they want, if they need to. Or if they feel like pressuring the opponent. Anyways, um, if you're playing with two armies that want to not really take the center, this is, you're going to come up with this in list creation. In list creation. Um, that's like your style of list. Like I say, Admech doesn't really want to take the center traditionally. They're not tough enough. Custodies and Death Guard always want to take the center. They love this mission. So this is just something. But you can't ignore this objective. Um, being a five objective mission, it's really, really, really tempting and easy to take Stranglehold and Direct Assault. Direct Assault is the mission specific secondary. We'll talk about that now. Um, direct Assault basically says if at the end of your player turn you hold the middle objective, you get three points. Alternatively, if you control both the middle objective and your opponent's home objective, you get five. That's something to keep in mind. Doesn't isn't really built into the strategy typically. I've actually done it with Dark Eldar, but that's not the point here. Um, so the two are built together. Stranglehold the Red Assault. Because like I said, it's really easy to just make a push and control these two for your two for ten, and that's kind of where you're gonna fortify your positions. And then it's very hard to actually fortify a position in the center of the board when your opponent can just attack you from both here and from right here. And if their army started behind a ruin right here, 
whatever you put here is just gonna get obliterated. So this is where things like four servitors, a singular chaos spawn, two company vets, anything like that gets such value in this mission almost more than any other. Probably this mission the most out of any of them. Because turn one, when your opponent has 2,000 out of 2,000 points sitting behind walls and ready to rock and roll, and you're just walking into charge range of all of it, maybe do that with the cheapest possible thing that you don't mind losing. It's, a little, it's gonna go better for you than just shoving in with everything. Unless your army is really, really, really good at it, like three Telemons or five Dread Knights or something like that. But most armies like to play this tit for tat game for a while, for at least a little while. Where I'll put out my servitors, I'll get my stranglehold, I'll get my direct assault, we'll cover secondaries more in depth in a minute. And then they get blown away, and then the admin player takes their four servitors, their five rangers, or five vanguard, or something, and just runs them back up. And they're like, I'm OPSEC. And then I am going to shoot these guys off and put on something a little bit more real and sturdy. And now my opponent has to use something a little bit more aggressive and more, more powerful to kill them. And now we got a trade war going. That's, that's essentially how it escalates. Um, that's a very easy way to play this mission. If you play this mission in the trade war style, there's a few things to keep in mind. What is your third secondary going to be? So this, is, this happens a lot if you take direct assault and stranglehold, and you're confident in holding these two consistently, which is pretty easy to do, especially if you have good terrain. And, and so it's like a, it's a strategy that's easy to form. So you see this commonly. And then just keep throwing stuff on the middle. The, some things to keep note of if you're doing that is that primary is going to end 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 15 for the person who goes second. So someone's going to have 45 and someone's going to 40. That's if no one really reacts and does something and pushes someone off on primary or anything. So we'll get to that in a second, but that's something you really want to keep note of. The, if both players are on track for 40 to 45, 40 for the person who went first, 45 for the person who went second, because all they have to do is just, you know, the four to five positions are the four to five positions, but one more unit just takes the middle at the end of the game, and that's the end of the trade war because the game's over, so that's my 45. So, person going second is set for 100, or set for 45 primary, and 40, it's person going, person second, 45 primary, person going first, 40 primary. Secondaries. Well, if we both take indirect assault, and we both take in string hold, which happens if you both take it, this almost certainly happens as the, as the course of the game, unless you two are very fighty armies, or one of you is. Um, so, direct assault and stranglehold are going to be penciled in for 15s, right? Like, I'm just going to, the trade war will just commence, and we'll just keep trading down that middle objective. I send a unit, you send a unit, I send a unit, you send a unit. So unless someone messes that up, in which case they do, this is another opportunity for an enormous swing factor. If you mess it up, you're missing stranglehold, you can't get those points back, you're missing direct assault, very, very challenging to get those points back. So every time you mess it up is six points to your score, or minus six. So that trade war becomes very dangerous and very powerful in the middle because you don't really want to ever mess it up. So my four servitors, yeah, you could answer them with your normal cheap obsec unit. Then I, I don't want to mess up killing your five vanguards, so I'm going to use five interceptors, which are my next cheapest trade unit. And then you don't want to mess up killing my five interceptors, so you're going to send um, maybe a rust stalker unit. And then I'm going to send my entire army, because now we've got a battle going. So that is how you would mess up the stranglehold direct assault. But in theory, if you did not interact and you just played tit for tat 40k, um, both players would get a 15 there. So now we're at the person going second is scheduled for a 75, and the person going first is scheduled for a 70. 45 points from the primary, and 30 from these two secondaries, and 40 from the primary, and 30 for these two secondaries. So then we have the last secondary. Generally speaking, this would be from the, this could be to the last. If so, we're playing a very non-interactive game of 40K. So if one person has a good to the last and the other person doesn't, that person's at a tremendously good advantage. If one person does rods, you know, it's actually really hard to rods this quarter. This is almost impossible to rods if you're playing this tit-for-tat game because it'll be screened and there's just an army right here, so, you know, that's good. And then over here, this is not impossible to rods, but it's challenging to rods. So rods is probably going to only be good for eight points, you know, because you're only going to rods three quarters, not four. 
So if someone's got to the last and the other person's got rods, all of a sudden, even if you're going second and you have that advantage of a primer where it's 45 to 40, your secondary is down 8 to 15, you're theoretically losing by two points until something happens. This is one of those missions where you want to make, if, if you get into this staring contest, you really want to make a points projection, just like I did. Um, if they took banners, what's their banners going to look like? They're going to have one banner raised there for five points or five turns. And the trade war, you're never going to raise a banner here. You'll probably raise a banner here, turn one, if there's infiltrators, turn two, if there isn't. So that's four points or five points, unless I disrupt it. So you want to get into this, uh, this idea of creating a, a score sheet and just pre-filling it out. Like if we just keep doing what we're doing, making it all game theory plays, that kind of thing, where it's just making logical choices the whole way through. How would it end up and work backwards? So if it ends up in this example where one guy takes rods and one guy goes, one guy takes rods and goes second, one guy takes to the last, that would be 45 for points for going second, 40 points for going first, primary, 30 and 30 for direct assault stranglehold, so 75 to 70. Rods will put that 75 up to an 83. And to the last, we'll put that 70 up to an 85. So now person going first is up two points. So person going first can recognize this, actually. Like, you could actually do this in a tournament. I've done it. And then not take an aggressive turn one. Because it'd be, a lot of players might think I'm losing. Or it's just, you know, I really want to fortify this position because I'm going second. So let me just see if I can really hold this, this mission. Could work, but now you're really playing an unnecessarily aggressive game that could go sideways for you. When, from a points perspective, you don't have to do anything. You can just sit right here and throw four servitors out. If you've actually bought these servitors, if you've not bought the servitors, then you're starting your trade war with interceptors or something expensive because you skipped your solo spawn, you skipped your brimstones, you skipped your land speeder storm, and you don't have something cheap to throw away. That's when you can't even attempt this tactic. I'll get to what you do for that in just a moment here. Um, so, if I know that the points projection is I'm winning, then I look at where I can put chinks in the arm, and that's for this mission specifically, because this mission the points are so, so you're going to score them, you know, like that's how, that's how I'm so confident in these numbers, because it's so hard to do anything to disrupt the natural flow of the scoreboard here. Like, what am I going to do? Contest that objective? This one's really hard. So, but that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Basically, where can I find a weakness in that projected, I'm projecting 87, he's projecting 85, or whatever I said. How, where can I look to wrestle a few points off of their score or add a few points to mine? Typically, you can't really add score to yours unless you're already assuming your opponent has a max of secondary, like in this case, for Tree Vicarious data. I assumed in my points projection as the player going first that he's never going to be able to rob this quarter. And I was, I think that's a reasonable assumption. You could argue he's never going to rods that quarter, but that's being really optimistic. I think reasonably, if I put my mind to it, recognizing this is a place where I can rob my opponent points, then he's never going to retrieve data in this quarter. Then where else could I rob my opponent points? Well, if I ever do, if I ever knock off a stranglehold or direct assault, that's minus six. That really ends the game, typically, if you, in one move, because Knocking that off often means not only are you taking off their strangle direct assault, it means they're not controlling the objective. If they're not controlling the objective, more likely than not, you are. As in they couldn't knock you off of it and then take it themselves. It's not that no one's just standing there, empty field. So if you're holding that one, very possible you got a 15 because of the, maybe they were unable to, to knock you off another one of yours also. So that typically will end the game, or, or it can in a staring contest type of thing. Alternatively, you could try to disrupt their primary. If you got these two on lock, and then this one, you're doing your trade war thing, maybe, maybe, maybe you could actually sneak some stuff back here, deep strike some guys back here, just start causing disruption. Maybe, maybe your opponent's trying to do the same over here, really trying to get it after we've established ourselves in hammer and anvil style. After I've put my interceptors over here, and I did my turn one, and we did our normal tit for tat, and we're doing the trade war. After that, both players are looking for chinks in the armor, right? We covered the chinks in the armor. It's one blocking direct assault domination, or direct assault stranglehold. Two, if there are points that are, maybe you could wrestle them off of your opponent, or off your opponent in the secondary game, banners, knock off a banner. To the last, is there one that maybe is, is shaky? Could I get one of the three of them? Um, if they took something like grind them down, 
really, really go out of your way, especially in a staring contest type match, to count kills and count points and treat your units as killed points, where every time you give up more kills than you give up three points. If you can just keep it even for one or two turns, knocks into a 12, knocks into a nine, knocks into a six. Could be huge chunks. So look for opportunities like that. And then of course, the final one, try to make a push onto a sneak objective, sneak attack and objective. Because both players will likely be trying to do a Dawn of War attack um, just to try to beat the steering contest. Try to, try to defend against it and launch it yourself. That would be what the ideal is there. So then the other style, because this is really good for all the armies that aren't tough and really good for playing the trade war and, and not, not being elite, you know, not being super mobile. What do those armies do? Well, those armies do this. They take a bunch of OPSEC things and they're really tough. And they, they try, if they're really good at this game, to physically block the objective. Like, like really physically block it. And then use some character support, so like Crow or Trajan or Drago or something like that. And of course someone in this mess is going to have Rites of War or OPSEC or something like that. And then you're going to put all of your points into defense and just say, I'm here. So in this one, you are a thousand percent taking direct assault. This is your home. This is where you live. Um, and then over here, this is where you'd have a bunch of interceptors, maybe one more Dread Knight. Over here, maybe just some servitors and, and, and like one squad. And try to take Stranglehold and just say, I'm never taking another movement phase. I'm done. I'm going to hold these three objectives. I'm going to Stranglehold. I'm going to direct assault. Um, usually these armies are built for to the last. This is something like Dark Angels would try to do with like 10 Deathwing Terminators. They would take Stranglehold, Direct Assault, and Stubborn Defiance and just say, I am done. Um, and your goal is to just create this. Create the shortest move, like deploy in the open over here with tough stuff. And then just walk the minimum distance possible to get on that objective. Start blocking it, body blocking it, so your opponent can't get OPSEC models onto it. This is a super hard objective to contest, because you, even if you have OPSEC yourself, even if you can survive Dread Knights, where am I going to get more mob bodies on the objective? Like, there's no space. So that's one of the goals. Dread Knights, I don't love this. I really don't love this if you're actually a Dread Knight player. Dread Knight player. Um, you can attempt it, but you're not unkillable. I don't think you're designed for this kind of strategy, but you could have tried it. Dark Angels, go ahead all day. Death Guard, that's what your jam. Custodies, this is here for you. Um, Dread Knights, you can do it. You really can. Not for me. Uh, Dread Knot players, if you're like Triple Redemptor, Double Contemptor, that kind of dude, you are doing this in this mission, I promise you. Um, those kinds of armies do this. And this is only... If you see a, your opponent's army is something like that, is like these are trigger words, Custodies, Death Guard, Dark Angels, etc. You may genuinely consider not taking direct assault yourself. And, and which is hard. It's not where you want to find yourself in this mission. You would really love to take direct assault. It's a great secondary. But if you know they're gonna do this, and if their army is designed to do this, where they just glob the objective and body block it and put obstacle on it and make it, this is where they own, your win condition then becomes fight for the other ones. You know, just move block this, um, this giant central mass and just get past it so you can start messing with these two. That becomes your plan. And if that's going to become your plan, it's, and, and you realize it's pretty much going to be impossible to get direct assault off this, maybe that's where you actually take the, the a more... I'm just going to have to move approach, like stranglehold. Instead of stranglehold, look for engage, because you're going to have to be in every quarter to win against the blob of characters. Or, or maybe you still take stranglehold, because again, you have to be con contesting the objectives over here to make a difference. Um, but definitely, this is something where I would take banners or rods. Uh, an army that's doing this, where they're just saying, this is my objective like that, they don't have the mobility, typically, to contest this objective or this objective. That's why they have made the I'm never taking a movement phase again strategy their strategy. So this is a clean banners for 10. And if you can ever actually get a nice assault off onto the Duana War side, these armies don't typically have too much in the screen, so maybe deep striking can get good. Um, if you can take their backfield and raise a banner late game, you'll get 12 or 13 points out of banners. You can get like a 12 out of rods pretty well if you're built for rods. If you have to the last in your army, this is a great time to take it because nothing here is interested in running across the table and beating you up. 
Um, they are just simply, um, they're good. They're good here. Now, if you try to fight them, if you make your plan, I have to fight you. I'm going to take direct assault myself. Good luck. Good luck. You're going to have to fight through this and it's going to suck. Now, this is what I was saying in the beginning of the video with Dark Eldar. They're such a mobile army. Dark Eldar, Harlequins, Grey Knights probably could, if I'm being honest, but I wouldn't try it. Um, those armies are so mobile, they can legitimately take direct assault against something like Talamons and Custodes or Dread Knights or Dark Angels by catching up on it. Because you do get three points if you just take them off this one. So the idea is, in the beginning turns, you can probably toss a couple Witches out there, or five Harlequin troops, or something quick and easy, and get it for like one to two turns by just holding the middle. And by turn three, you're actually an enveloped your army, your opponent's army so much, you can actually attack this backfield. You'll probably get like a 12 out of it, actually. I've done that a couple times. Um, super mobile armies can try that. But that's pretty much direct assault or sweep and clear. This is a super interesting mission. It's the finals of both of the Orlando and the NOLA GW Open events, which was won by Mr. Siegs. He won't let me forget. Um, so, you know, I don't know what they're running in Austin, even though I will be commentating again, but I would expect that it could be the same. I, I don't think it, they're, you know, yeah. And then I can tell you almost every other event I've been to does run this mission at some point. It's a really interesting mission. It's got a lot. It looks simple. Five objectives. You deploy near each other. Let's fight. Just go to the middle with direct assault. There's a lot more to it. And if you can really get that bit that's a lot more to it, you'll see your, your success in this mission really skyrocket. Do we have any questions in the chat, Mr. Siegs? I answered them already. Wow, my strategy session was so comprehensive. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're on YouTube and watching this, check this out. Check out the war. We do stuff like this all the time. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll catch you later. Dive even deeper into competitive 40K and become a member of the world's most knowledgeable and positive community. The War Room is an exclusive group that brings together the world's best 40K players as coaches to help anyone from a newer player to an experienced tournament veteran learn, grow, and reach their goals within our shared hobby. Each week we offer a variety of live stream coaching matches centered around illuminating the thought process and in-game decision making of top players. We explain everything we're doing and why. You'll learn about the ever-evolving meta, match play mission theory, list making, and discussion of every faction in the game, and have access to analysis of all the latest rules. Our team of highly experienced coaches teach weekly clinics on each individual faction, strategy sessions on deployment and cool tricks, and meta analyses each week during Meta Monday. We are committed to not only providing the best knowledge for players available, but also building a one-of-a-kind community. Come be a part of the War Room.